how can this happen after back surgery? Is that common? This is a phenomenon called proximal junctional kyphosis, and it can happen anywhere from six to 41% of the time after having spinal fusion surgery. Six to 41%, that's quite a range. Yesterday, I presented the case of a 70-year-old female who had these series of operations. So let's explain from the beginning and how this catastrophe happened. Her journey with back surgery began when she underwent an L3 vertebral kyphoplasty for a compression fracture. A kyphoplasty is a very common procedure that we do to fix people that have compression fractures from osteoporosis. If you have brittle bones, they're more susceptible to fracture. Sometimes after a vertebral compression fracture, we can inject cement into bones to help with the pain. She had back pain before she even broke her back, but after the fracture, her back pain worsened. For the simplicity of this video, I won't go through all the MRI or CT imaging, but here you can see on x-ray that she has degenerative disc disease at L3, L4. When she failed conservative treatment, she went to a spine surgeon who offered her a spinal fusion procedure. And without further questioning, she had the surgeon perform the surgery on her, and it actually did help with her pain for about a year. I want to stop the video right here and point out one thing before we proceed. In my opinion, she should have never have had this surgery. Performing spinal fusion on a patient with osteoporosis is asking for complications. That's why any good spine surgeon will check a bone density test before offering a patient a spinal fusion operation. And if the patient does have osteoporosis, we should perhaps consider other options before considering spinal fusion, or if spinal fusion is necessary, consider treating the patient for their osteoporosis before surgery. I do wanna point out that in neurological emergencies, sometimes we do have to perform surgeries on patients with osteoporosis without treating them, and that's not what I'm talking about here. So where did this go wrong? Within one year of having this spinal fusion, she had this progression of degenerative disc disease above the fusion, and then after two years, you can see the severity of the degenerative disc disease above the fusion. Not only that, if we take a step back and look at the global alignment of her spine, here, here, and here, you can see that over time, she's starting to lean forward. And in an exaggerated picture I showed at the beginning of the video, this is called proximal junctional kyphosis. We also call that PJK. When we perform a spinal fusion, we make a part of the spine immobile, and the next segment above that fusion will take on a little extra motion. And in some people, for a variety of different reasons, they can develop a kyphosis where they basically topple over the top of the fusion. There is a wide range of reported percentages in the literature ranging anywhere from 6 to 40%. But the bottom line is that it's not uncommon. Every spine surgeon knows that this can happen and should be talking about those potential risks with patients. After our patient had this proximal junctional kyphosis at L2-3, she was offered an extension fusion. She underwent another fusion from L2 down to her pelvis and she had catastrophic failure of this fusion after her surgery. Here you can see the screw fracture and she's essentially toppling over the top. She was in horrific pain at this point. So much pain that she says she wished she never would have had any of these back operations because now her pain was worse than before she started. She came to my practice and the only thing that I could offer her at this point in time was a salvage operation to completely realign and fuse her entire spine. And shockingly enough, when she came into my practice, she had not had a bone density tested by any spine surgeon before any of these operations. Even without a bone density test, a patient that has a kyphoplasty from a spontaneous compression fracture is a red flag that she should have underlying osteoporosis. So in my opinion, she should have never have had that first fusion surgery. Started her on the pathway of no return. I will say that I don't think the surgery was done maliciously, but I do think many, many surgeons don't check patients' risk factors prior to offering them operations for pain because sometimes it's easier to say yes than to tell someone that they can't help them at all. PJK is a real problem that can be extremely challenging to deal with. It's an emerging complication in deformity surgery because of the amount of robust hardware that we have available to correct people's deformities. So how can we prevent it? There's things that we can identify before surgery to see which patients may be at risk, as well as things that we can do in the operating room to help prevent it. The four most common risk factors are patient's age, meaning greater than 55, 
low bone density, such as patients with osteoporosis, patients with a higher BMI or being overweight will also increase that risk. And the last one is preoperative sagittal balance, meaning if a patient is really kyphotic and then we straighten them up, their body's natural tendency is to resume that prior pattern and they have a higher risk of developing PJK. This is a picture I got of another example of PJK from a journal article and you can see how this patient underwent a correction of a kyphosis. Over time, you can see where she develops PJK and starts to fall over the top of her construct. This patient underwent a revision surgery and subsequent progressive PJK and had to have a massive spinal correction done. The picture that I showed at the beginning of the video, this patient also had to have a massive fusion in order to correct their PJK. Besides identifying and potentially treating those patients at risk going into surgery, there are some techniques that we can use in the operating room to help minimize the risk of PJK. Some of those include the type of techniques that we use, like minimizing the soft tissue damage at the very top of the construct to ensure that the muscles and ligaments above the construct are stable. We can also change the way we place hardware and the different types of hardware we place can also minimize those risks. For simplicity's sake, I won't go through all the exact details of the different techniques we use because there's really no evidence-based guidelines to help us with this. The data that we have for recommendations of care with PJK is level B and C data, which is not great data. This has been more and more of a problem over the past several decades because of the development of such robust hardware that we utilize to correct patients' deformities. And hopefully over time, we'll understand more and more and have good solutions with good data behind it. However, the key point that I've seen over the years in my practice and preventing PJK for the most part is using common sense. It's incredibly important to understand patients' risk factors going into surgery. How healthy are they? How good are their bones? Do they smoke? Are they overweight? Is their strength in their body and their core strong enough to have this type of operation? You can't just look at an x-ray and decide what you're going to do to a patient. You have to look at that patient as a whole person and how this operation could potentially change their life. And sometimes the right answer is no surgery. For some surgeons, that's a hard pill to swallow because we wanna help people. So let's get back to our patient's case. If we said no here, this would never have happened. But inevitably, poor patient selection led to problems that we had to fix. And now, essentially, her whole spine is fused. If she had to do it over again, she said she would never have had surgery. Her pain is markedly better now, but at what cost? So if you're having a back operation, make sure you ask questions. Are there any identifiable risk factors that you could potentially correct going into surgery to make sure your outcomes are better? These are all questions that you should be able to confidently ask your surgeon and get answers to. And remember, never be afraid to ask for a second opinion. After all, this is your back that's being operated on. Our patient is now three years out from this surgery and has had no progressive kyphosis, and she's still on medications for her osteoporosis. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week, and I'll go through another case. Remember, June is National Scoliosis Awareness Month, so feel free to like and share this video. Have a good week.